Welcome to South Central Regional Libraries Safe Within Your Walls programming, supported by Safe at Home Manitoba. My name is Angela Lovell, and I'm the administrator at the Manitou branch of South Central. And today I'm delighted to welcome a special guest, writer Karen Emelson. Karen lives at Gruntal, Manitoba, and is the author of two non-fiction books, Where Children Run and When Memories Remain, is co-author of a memoir, My Every Breath, about transplant survivor Anna Maynard, and has also written a novel, Be Still the Water, which was a finalist in the 2019 Canadian Book Club Awards and was shortlisted for the Margaret Lawrence Award for Fiction. So welcome to Karen. Hi, Angela. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've been really looking forward to this. So it's uh, been a nice excuse, nice excuse to, um, with all this time we're spending at home, a nice excuse to um, put on a nice scarf and earrings and some lipstick and dress up a little bit. So <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So Karen, um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? and how you got into writing and what led you to write your first two books and then to go on to write your novel? Well, <laughs> um, I've wanted to be a writer <clears throat> my whole life. It's uh, something that was um, just, I, re I have very few memories be before wanting to be a writer. I, um, I didn't know that and, and the realization came when I was about, I don't know, eight, seven, eight years old, when, um, when I discovered that books didn't just come from libraries, that people wrote them. And that was, um, and from that point forward, I started writing all of, like, I started writing stories and, uh, and, you know, talked to people, you know, saying I wanted to be a writer and things. But of course, you know, back in the day, back in the 1960s and 60s and 70s, that kind of sounded like saying, well, I'm going to be a movie star. <laughs> and so, you know, you didn't uh, didn't talk about it very much. So I did kind of suppress that desire. Um, well, it was always there. I was always writing something. I was always reading, but I, I stopped talking about it. And there was that idea that this was not a, a very practical thing for me to do. And um, I ended up not um, going to school for writing. Um, I came from a um, pretty blue collar family. There wasn't a lot of um, extra money for things like anything, really. Um, parents were, you know, just kind of getting by and uh, like so many others. And so I didn't go to university, but I was constantly, constantly writing. And um, I did get a lot of encouragement from one particular teacher, which really, really helped me. Um, in fact, I, I have a little thing here. So in grade, in grade five, I, um, um, this is, I keep everything. I'm one of those, I keep everything. So I have, I have boxes and boxes of files. Well, this is, this is my very first journal from grade five. And um, that really set me on, you know, it gave me an excuse to write every day. And um, so that's, so that I continued on with journaling as I became a teenager, journaling just became a place where, you know, you vented all of your frustrations and a lot of sadness, and a lot of terrible poetry and things like that. As far as writing actual stories, I, I did write a couple, um, kept them to myself and, and didn't do anything with them. And it really wasn't until I moved to Manitoba and I moved out to um, um, near Ashern and I became a, a reporter with the Interlake Spectator that my writing career really, really took off um, I, because I was writing every day. I had um, a great editor, uh, Roger Newman was my editor and he was just a fantastic guy. I learned so much from him about, about, write, about writing and editing. And, and, um, and it was when I was working for The Spectator that uh, the Pishki twins came to me and asked me to um, write their story in the paper. And it was one of those fortuitous moments in life that you look back on and it, it was just, it just started me down a completely different path. I had always wanted to write a book, but I didn't really have anything um, to write about. These are the days before internet. So really, how do, you, how do you even do something like that? I had some books I subscribed to Writer's Digest, but I was, I didn't, I really didn't know how to start um, a novel. 
So the Pischke twins was written. Um, I started interviewing them. It took about a, a year and a uh, year and a half almost. And, and, then, and in the meantime, so I got all of the interviews together and then I started writing the book and I just sat down and I just wrote it. I planned it all out. So I had, so, um, so I had a clear structure and looking back on it, it that was the right way for me to go is to, to structure this out and, and then just write it. And of course it, it was a it was a phenomenal success <laughs> given you know i didn't know that it wasn't really possible to do this <laughs> and i did it so it um that would be um a little advice to future writers you know that um sometimes not knowing you can do something you know you can actually do a lot more because you don't know that you actually can't do it. <laughs> so, um, so that's how I got started, but I've always wanted to be a novelist. I've always had a lot of stories in, in my mind. And, and so that got, got me writing. And from that point forward, I really started focusing on, on writing and um, yeah. So that's a, a little bit about me and uh, how I got started. Wonderful. So, where then did you get the inspiration for your novel, Be Still the Water? And, and where did the characters for that book come from, Karen? Yeah. Um, okay. So after, after Where Children Run, I wrote a sequel to Where Children Run um, because everybody wanted to know what happened to the twins after they left the farm. I wrote that and, um, and that went quite well. Um, people were were quite thrilled to to hear about more about the boys and and it was a really good experience for um, David and Dennis as well because they were able to tell the second part of the story and that's where um, they were able to you know say even though we had this horrible childhood we we overcame it and and were happy and and successful so th so that was great. At this, around the same time, I started I started working on a, a fiction a fiction trilogy. <laughs> it was huge and too big of a story for me. I I didn't realize it again at the time, and um, I worked on that. And then I set that aside because I realized this is too big. This is too big for me. It's it's was a it's a time travel trilogy which is might be the hardest thing to write. So, so I had to set that aside. And I wrote another, um, another story that came when I was out in, in Saskatchewan. And, and I had an idea for a book just, just came to me. And I sketched out and I, I started working on that. And then I got to a certain point and set that aside. Um, started working on something else, abandoned that, came back to the other one. So, so I was working on that story when in 2011, when Lake Manitoba flooded the farmland out at Vogar, where I had spent, you know, 27 years of my life and um, uh, family and, and friends. Uh, my son, of course, still lived there and all of the neighbors and that was a community that I, I really felt a part of that com community. And, and in many ways, I still do. Um, that's, that's kind of home for me. I was 19 when I left Ontario and, and when I moved there. And um, so, so I, I still feel strong ties. So I was very, very upset when I saw that, that the lake was, was overflowing. And um, what it did was, I saw a Facebook post from a friend who who was talking about the flood and 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 the water, and it made me think back to all of the stories that I had heard years before. Um, it's an Icelandic community, and there's a lot of storytelling. There's a lot of um, remembering of the past, a lot of documentation of things that went on, and. We had had visitors years before in, I can't remember the exact year. And, and they told me a, a couple of stories about the actual farm where we lived. And 
piecing together those stories along with some of the other lake stories and the community stories from when it was first settled, I the the book idea just just came to me. I I had had I had written an outline after that visit with the with the lady who came to to see us. I had written an outline, but you know was working on something else. So I'm always I was always working on one thing and then I set it aside and start because I get stuck. I'd get stuck and I wouldn't be sure exactly. Okay, where am I going with with this? And I would get frustrated. And then there'd be this new shiny thing to work on. I'd start working on that. But with be still the water. When I started working on that, I did not stop. I um, I didn't go back to anything else. I just felt so passionately about the characters that I just kept going. The characters are based on some real people from there, from the past, from the early 18, 1900s. A lot of the stories have true elements to them, things that actually did happen. Um, I've, it is fictionalized. I've changed names. I've changed. And, and of course, with some of the stories, they've just, they have been, um, many of them have just been passed down. So how much have they changed? How much is true? How much is fiction? By the time you hear a story, you know, what I wanted to do, my goal, my, my goal when, when I was started writing Be Still the Water was, was to tell the story of the lake and of the immigrants and many Many of the people who are still there and who were in 2011 fighting that flood, um, their ancestors had already fought floods on the lake, and they are the ones who settled that land. They were there um, during the, the floods in, in the early 1950s. And so the, these are multi-generational um, cattle ranches. And so that is what really made me want want to tell to tell these stories about um, why why don't they just leave this place? And um, you know, it it was uh, the floods back in the fifties. They were natural floods. The one in two thousand eleven was a man made flood. The water was diverted through the portage diversion. A um, a story that I knew from my reporting days back in the nineties. So what be still the water was for me was a a culmination of many, many things. I was using the stories that I'd heard, um, that I'd written about when we had high water years in the 90s, and I was reporting on that. Um, the old stories, the beauty of the place, the solitude, and, um, and a lot of the funny stories. I had heard funny stories. I would go to the Sigel and S ball tournament and afterwards the team would be sitting around telling stories. And of course, they would always be talking about the past. And so I heard a lot of the old stories. And so I worked those all into it. And so my characters are, some are made up, some are a combination of um, real and imagined. I, I've, I've said that before, you know, I, I write about people. Um, some of them are real and some of them are imagined. And sometimes I, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> So um, yeah, so that's that's where the inspiration for that book came. Yeah. So, what lessons do you think you've learned over your your writing career about you know the writing process about getting published, which I know is is something that a lot of writers struggle with and are you know you've written this this work, but how do you get it out there? What would what what would you say are some of the major uh, things that you have learned over the years, just just through your experiences. Well, I'd have to say the biggest the the biggest thing that I, I've learned <clears throat> is patience. I've learned to be a lot more patient with um, where children run. There was no room for patience because um, Peter Warren from CGOB Radio was. He was the um, start of that book. When, when the twins were on the radio, he was saying, Karen Emelson is, is writing this book about the twins. And whenever something um, would happen in the city or you know, in the province, and, and he would comment on it when it came to child abuse, he would reference that this book is being written and that it's going to be out soon. Well, I didn't have a publisher. So um, I that book was self-published. And, um, and same thing with with my others. Be still the water um, came very close to 
I've tried to find a publisher. It came really close. The word count um, is high. It's a, it's a long book. And, you know, publishers don't necessarily want to take, a, um, take on who would be considered a person without a real track record in the traditional publishing lane. You know, so I made the decision to to self-publish that one as well. Um, but I took a longer time. Um, I think it's really important. Patience is important. Attention to detail is important. Proofreading is huge. With, you know, and we all, I think, even the traditional publishers struggle with proofreading. Those how those typos get in there is beyond me, I don't know. Um, so I have learned to be very, uh, I'm diligent by nature, a little bit of a perfectionist, not that I'm perfect, <laughs> but I'm constantly, you know, so that is something that, that has, I've really been focusing on. I, I'm, I'm not in a hurry. I've learned patience. So, um, so that would be, that would be me, the main thing that I've learned. Um, yeah, I've always been open to to listening to editors uh, because of my that early training with Roger Newman at the at the Inner Lake Spectator. Um, so that's something. Um, yeah, I think that would be that would be the main thing that stands out for me is learning patience to work on work on your story, put it away for a little while bring it back out, not be in too much of a rush. I sent out, um, when I was sending out my early manuscripts, I sent them, like, or my manuscripts, I sent them out too early. So I was getting rejected um, because they weren't quite ready. Um, learning to write has been really hard. And again, it's back in the days before the internet. How do you learn to do this thing, you know? So, um, so that would probably be and it is the hardest thing to learn, um, patience, because when, when you finish something, you're so excited to get it out there and, and you want people to read it and you want feedback of, of course, just good reviews and good feedback. You don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to hear the, the bad things. Um, but having said that, um, something else that I have learned through this process is that what you write isn't necessarily for every person. And you find that yourself with your, the own, with the books that you write. And as sometimes I find it a little frustrating um, when I'm seeing um, anywhere, people will hold up a book and they'll say, what do you think about this book? Should I read it? And I'm not talking about my book. I'm just talking, I'm talking about every book. And people will chime in. No, I didn't like it. That was a terrible book. Yes, it's the most wonderful book in the world. Definitely read it. We all have um, such varying tastes. And what appeals to one person doesn't necessarily appeal to the other person. But, you know, that doesn't make it a bad book. And I think that is something that I, I had never realized. And so, you know, I'm not someone to, um, to write reviews or to tell people to criticize books because, you know, there is an audience for, there's an audience for all of the books that are out there. And uh, that is something that I certainly have learned um, over the years. So Karen, have you got any other tips for aspiring writers who might be watching this video? Yes, yes, um, this is a good one. Um, I remember the first time that I um, started to, to read like a writer instead of like a reader. It was, um, um, we were on holidays and on the um, hotel bookshelf, down in, in Mexico, we were in Mex early, one of our first Mexican holidays, I found the book, um, The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kitt. And I sat down to read that. And, and it was kind of amazing because I started reading it and it was the, and, and I could see what she was doing. And I had, and I had been working on my own fiction unsuccessfully, not understanding um, what I needed to do, but I had been reading a little bit about it and then about, you know, um, character motivations and all that. I, I started reading and, and it was learning that. And then I opened this book and there it was. I, um, so I started reading it and I started making notes. 
And I must have read, I read that book um, three or four times just in a row because and, and I could see. And, and so I would say one of the first steps is that um, to start reading books and, and analyze what, what that writer is doing, how they're putting that together. Because, you know, um, books have blueprints. It's much like the, um, uh, the blueprint that's, that's used when, when they build your house. Like all houses have certain elements to them that are, are common amongst houses. And books and stories are the same way. And they're all laid out a little bit different and, and uh, you know, different, different colorings, different choices. You make different choices. No two houses are exactly the same. Um, just like the people that live in them aren't exactly the same. But, but if you, you can model your, your outline um, accordingly, right? You can put in all of the parts and, and follow what other writers have done. That, that's something that, um, that really helped me. That's when I started to feel like, oh, you know what? I think I can do this. And this was prior to Be Still the Water. Um, outlining, I know some people I used to um, for myself personally. And so, you know, take from this whatever you want to use. I used to just start writing. I would feel um, inspired and I would start writing. And I would end up, spend, it, but Be Still the Water took five years. And part of the reason for that is I would write and I would just get writing on these big tangents and I would keep going. And, and, and then when I sat down and I started, I have to go, so, like, where's this going? And I made an outline. A lot of that writing was thrown out. So now I'm, I'm a strong believer in, um, in outlining first and if I feel inspired to write a scene I go and I do it but I stop I don't keep going on because um you know novels turn into these big huge things that have like way too many words and then you can't find a publisher because the word count is too high and they they go off in the wrong directions I think uh, most writers we've all we've all done this so I find that me sticking to an outline and knowing my characters their motivations like really knowing them, um, the midpoint, the at the midpoint, there needs to be a change. There needs to be a twist or a change or a revelation. So I plan all of these. When I know my story ahead of time, I plan them all, all out ahead. So, so I would recommend that, especially if people find that they get writing too far and they lose themselves in the story and or people are giving you feedback, you're, you're showing it to, to your, your sister or your mom, your cousin, and they're not saying, you know, this is fantastic. If they're not saying that, then, hmm, you know, you might be suffering a little bit from that sort of, that sort of a, a problem with a lack of direction or a lack of clear conflict or characters. I don't care about these characters. Like, do you, do you know your characters? Um, do you know, you need to know everything about them. You have to know, need to know what they want. So I would say, um, spend a little bit of time on, on reading other, other stories and deconstructing them, taking them apart. Um, another little bit of advice is um, there, there are writers, at, we're all at, at different places in what we want. I think most of us want to be published, but not, not necessarily everyone. Um, some of us write pro professionally full time. Um, that's what I'm doing now. I haven't always always done that. But some of us maybe can't, like maybe and maybe don't even really want to. Maybe you just want to write your your um, family's history, and that's okay. It's it's good to have a clear idea of exactly um, what you want to do because then you know how much what you need to put into it, and um, how much you're willing to to sacrifice to make it happen. So have a clear idea of, about what you want to do now. Like there has never been a better time to be a writer than right now. It is fantastic. We have access to so much information on the internet. If you need to know something, you can just look it up right away. And that is, it was so hard before. Um, you needed to have your dictionary. You needed to, you couldn't just quit. Nothing was quick. Now we can quickly look something up get the answer um, just like that. So even there are plenty of workshops online. If you Google um, how to 
um, the five act, four act structure, how to save the cat, which is a um, screenwriting software, which many novelists use now to, to highlight the points in their novel where there are going to be twists, where there are going to be new characters introduced. Um, of, and of course, your, you know, your major conflict and, and, and then your, your climax at the end, and then how much time do you spend after the climax finishing up the story, all of those things, you can find all of that out online. So, so it is a, a great time for, for people who want to write. Um, and then to sort of finish off my thoughts, you know, having said all of that, beware of the distractions. Um, I set aside time to write and um, because it's very easy to get distracted doing other things and especially sitting in front of a computer all day when there's um, um, Facebook and Instagram and it, it's way easier to take a picture and upload that into, into Instagram than it is to figure out you've backed yourself into a corner <laughs> with your story and now you got to figure out how to get out of it or um, well, I happen to like rewriting. So when I said that part before about all of this stuff that I wrote, I don't, I love rewriting. I don't like taking big chunks of, I, I big chunks of story that scenes that never get used and throwing them out. I don't like that. But when I know that I have a scene and it's going in the book, um, I love rewriting. So, so that's, that's, you know. So that's not, for me, that distraction, but sometimes when you get stuck and it's easier to just sit online, it's a big time waster. We do, we do need it and we do need to keep in contact. It's a great way for me to keep in contact with people, but you know, you can go down those rabbit holes pretty quick. So um, if you're serious um, about getting a project done, then, then set, out, set aside time every day to work on it. And um, preferably, I've, I've read studies that show that if you go into it with a clear mind, you're actually more creative. So for me, that's first thing in the morning. I'm a morning person. I get up and don't even, don't phone me, don't uh, email me or anything like that. Um, I write first thing in the morning and, and finish up about one in the afternoon. And, um, and then I go on and I do other things that don't take that same level of creativity and concentration. So, so you know, figure out what works for you and then do your absolute best to, um, to stick to it. And, and then uh, after that, there's plenty of other advice out there. Like, you know, you have to find beta readers, people to read the manuscript. There's um, all sorts of um, wonderful advice. I know that um, you're, Angela, you're, you're talking to a lot of writers, so I'm sure there's more advice out there, but those would be the things that I think are, are pretty important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think everything you've said is, is, is wise. It's, it's very true, you know, and it's, it's, it sounds easy, but sometimes it's not quite as easy, is it? But, um, but yeah. No. Yeah. Cause writing is hard. It is. It's, very it hard. is hard. It's, it's hard work. It's not physical work, but you know, I find that there's nothing else that I do that, that exhausts me like writing. And that seems hard to believe because you know, you're just sitting here. <laughs> How can that be tiring? That tires me more than, more than anything else that I do. So, you know, so to know that when you start something, you're going to be really tired when you're done. <laughs> But I love it, and most writers do, and most of us, if you really want to be a writer, then you have to write, whether it's for whether it's to be published or not, because you'll never truly be happy if you don't. There's those there'll always be that thing that you're wanting that you're not getting. And uh, sometimes just writing a little bit will uh, satisfy that need. yeah. So would you be willing to read us an excerpt from Be Still the Water, Karen? I, I would. Okay. I'm going to read. Okay, I'm, I'll have to get the book here. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to read. I'm going to read a part. Oops. Hit my thing here. Okay. I'm going to read a part um, when I've gone out to libraries and book launches and um, things like that. I've, I've usually read. So, well. 
you know, when you write a book, there are lots of favorite parts in it, right? And um, I've usually read when Austa meets Bjorn because that that was a particular that was one of my one of my favorite parts. Um, it's hard to read from a book though that he, if person hasn't read it without giving up some spoilers, right? So so I have to try and pick something that everyone will find entertaining without being spoilerish. This is a bit of a spoiler, but it's okay because it's a it's a good spoiler. So what we have here is the formation of the Siglanes ball team. Now the Siglanes ball team <laughs> um, ended up they were still going um, way up into the late. 1990s early 2000s so this is the this is my version of the startup of the Siglan S ball team i'm sure it didn't go exactly like this but it would have went something similar <laughs> so everyone has gathered at the school because the school in the in these communities was the place where everyone everyone gathered in the early days in 19 this would have taken place in 1906 1907 the um there wasn't even a church there. So they even had their church services. The Icelandic communities, the school was um, the most important thing because to, to become educated was the goal. So they've all gathered at the school. Now I have quite a few different names here, but um, we have our, our main characters, but let's see, we'll start. So they've gathered at the school and, they're, and they have, um, the boys are, gathered around, there is, a, there is a ball team already at the Narrows. And so this is what has given them the idea that they need a ball team too. And, um, and then when they start going, to, they can start going to the Narrows picnic and they can um, put a team in. Um, so here we go. Okay. Four horses came trotting into the schoolyard. There were gasps and cheers at the sight of Oli Thorstensen's four youngest boys all in their 20s, born one right after the other. These were the most intimidating young men I'd ever seen, long boned and broad shoulders, each stood well over six feet. All had high cheekbones, full lips and distinct noses that turned up at the end, a feature they'd inherited from their father, one that would be passed down for generations to come. The three older boys were dark haired, but the youngest was fair skinned and heavier set with hair that stuck out like fresh cut straw. I knew nothing about baseball. Few of us did, but in numbers, we had a team. And by the looks of it, now with some strength behind it. We heard there are baseball tryouts today, the youngest one said as the four came confidently across the yard. His name was Olafur, and, we'd, and soon we'd see that he was full of energy and talk. I think we might be able to help your team. JK was the coach and he met them halfway to offer a welcoming handshake. We'll see about that. Have you ever played before? Olafur shrugged. How hard can it be? JK grinned at Elsie. I guess you'll find out. Our Amma hollered that they must be hungry nudging Signe, who boldly held a plate out to them, while Thora and I shrank, stealing quick, quick glimpses when we thought they weren't looking, giggling to the point we embarrassed ourselves without even knowing. Few in those days could afford the luxury of owning a baseball glove, so most came empty-handed. Finn gave his glove to Leifer and so that he could back catch instead of Amma, and the team trotted back to the field. Which one of you wants to bat first? JK asked the Thorstensons. Olafur was quick to offer. Now, batting is as much about good technique as it is strength, JK explained, showing him how to stand, hold the bat and swing. It is important to focus on the pitcher and not take your eyes off the ball. Had JK been instructing a girl, she would have listened closely. But apparently, Olafur already knew everything about batting and was anxious to get started. He took the bat and examined it. Standing loosely at home plate, he let it rest on his shoulder. If I hit it over the trees, the prettiest girl in the community has to marry me, he said. Everyone laughed, but the girl shrieked, captivated by this forward young man. And who might that be, Osi hollered. 
She's sitting right over there in the blue dress, he said, pointing over his shoulder at Signy. Someday she will be my wife. Everyone gasped at his boldness. Bjorn looked unimpressed as he wrapped his fingers tight around the ball. Her father might have something to say about that, Elsie hollered. He might not have a choice, Oliver quipped. Everyone laughed again, stealing glances at Bobby, whose cheeks were flaming by then. All right, Bjorn, let him have it, JK said. Bjorn nodded, his mouth quirking upward ever so slightly. Focusing hard, he wound up, firing a fastball straight across home plate. Olafur swung hard and missed. Pabe looked delighted as the ball thwapped neatly into Leifer's glove. Undeterred, Olafur swung again, and then again. It wasn't that he swung far too soon that caused everyone to chuckle, but his loud grunt. I jabbed Signe in the side with my elbow to annoy her. Without taking her eyes off Olafur, she punched me back. I was hoping you might be our cleanup batter, JK said, eyeing Olafur's brothers who were all smiling, but perhaps I was wrong. Olafur let the bat fall as he shook out his shoulders. How do you hold this goddamn thing again, he asked. Mother tisked. But Amma liked his spunk. I could tell by the way she clapped her hands and cheered. Come on, Olafur, show him what you got. JK seemed pleased by this. He spoke quietly, lifting Olafur's right shoulder back, left shoulder up, left elbow up. He coached, and Olafur's head bobbed as he listened. Then he dug his heels into the grass and turned to face Bjorn. His smirk was gone, but not the gleam in his eye. He focused with such intensity, we all grew silent. A hiss escaped Bjorn's lips when he threw the ball again. Anyone who has watched hardball knows instantly the crisp sound of a home run. We cheered wildly as the ball screamed over the trees, landing far in the bush. Olafur tossed the bat on the ground and sloped around the bases, the team patting him on the back as he went. Signe blushed but she did not giggle or change expression even when we teased her. She focused her soft smile on Olafur and did not look away when their eyes met. He touched the brim of his hat at her as he stamped his foot, crushing Gudrun's pie plate, and then trotted to the outfield. <laughs> now, if you've ever seen the Sigliness ball team play, <laughs> <laughs> that was the spirit in which it was always done. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you, Carol. Well, thank you. Thank you. I enjoy reading. It's um it's uh, something I've I've always enjoyed reading out loud. So when people ask, I'd so you know, I like to do it as long as it doesn't come across as as arrogant, you know, like here, sit and listen to me read. <laughs> no, it was it was wonderful. And and it is a wonderful book. Um and I, that leads me to ask you, I understand that you have just finished writing another manuscript last fall. Is that correct? I finished it. I finished it. What are we? We're in February now. I finished it last winter at this time. And I started sending it out. Um, and so I started sending it out. And it is currently with my agent and it is being um, looked at by a few editors. So we'll see what happens. That comes back to that patience thing. You need to have patience. With the situation um, in publishing right now, it's really hard because it's hard to launch a book. Um, people are getting zoomed out. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit nervous about, uh, you know, this one come when this one is going to come out because um you know you need you need some sales it needs to get off to a good start so now it's a, a bit of a challenge in the um in the publishing industry so we'll wait and see what um what happens um if so as to when it's coming out i honestly don't know it'll be maybe maybe this fall maybe not until next year i should probably tell you what it's about Yes. Okay. Yes, um, it's different. I, I, I seem to always be writing something just a little bit different from the last one. Um, this isn't historical fiction. It is, um, it's um, a little bit of a psychological suspense. It's um, 
the working title is I Saw What You Did. And it's the story of Bree Fitzpatrick, a 26 year old woman with Down syndrome. And when Bree was a child, she witnessed a murder. And approximately 20 years later, her brother was arrested for that murder. And now she needs to make a choice, knowing that um, if convicted, her brother is gonna spend the rest of his life in jail. She needs to decide if she's brave enough to come forward and talk about what she saw that night um, or keep silent. And, um, and the problem is that um, the murder is someone that she has grown to love and trust, um, but she also doesn't realize that um, regardless that she's in danger and so are most of the people that she loves. So that's what the story is about. That's so we'll nice. wait and see. Yeah, I'm excited. I know people are asking me what's, you know, what's coming out next. And, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So that, that will probably be the next one. Yeah. Wow. And, and you're also working on a sequel to Be Still the Water? Yes, um, I am working on it. I, um, it, unfortunately, I started working on the sequel to Be Still the Water right after I finished it. And then I wrote two books in between. I wrote the book with um, Anna Maynard. She had come to me when I was working on the sequel and I decided to help her with with her with her story and then I um and then I wrote I saw what you did now part of the reason for that is I know what I want to do with the with be still the water I have the story I'm now I'm now writing it I ran into problems last time because as everyone knows who's read be still the water there are a couple of big twists in there and with the story that I plan to tell about um, finding Freya's child, <laughs> there, um, without coming out, and um, how do you write the sequel in the present day when when Ousta is dying without revealing some of the little secrets that are are hidden in the manuscript? So I I got I got stumped, and I had to work my way through that um, through some careful outlining. And um, yeah, so now I'm working on it. I started I started a little little bit last year, um, lots this fall, and now I'm right back into it this winter. Yeah, so I do plan on finishing that book this year. Great. Sounds like you're going to be a busy person. Yes. Well, I, and I have a few more stories, ideas percolating, but um, never say, you know, you hate to say that you're never going to, but I, I don't think anything is going to come along to, to sidetrack me. I'm pretty sure Be Still the Water is the one that I'm going to finish. I'm into it pretty heavy right now and I'm, I'm quite enjoying it. So I'm, I've got it all figured out now. It's just a matter of getting it done. Great. Well, thank you again, Karen. It's been lovely speaking with you, catching up with you. And uh, thank you for doing this. And oh. we will include a link to Karen's website, karenemmelson.com at the end of this video. And you can go there to learn a little bit more about Karen's work, to find out how to purchase her books, sign up for her newsletter and follow her on Facebook and Instagram. So with that, we'll say goodbye to Karen. And again, thank you so much, Karen. We really appreciate you, uh, you, you joining us. Well, thank you very much, Angela. It's been a real pleasure. I, I, I loved it. I love doing this sort of thing. And thank you for joining us for this Manitoba Safe at Home presentation of Safe Within Your Walls.